Hi everyone. Today I'm going to take you through the case study of Marvel. The case study explains one of the greatest turnaround in modern business history. Marvel was founded in the year 1939 and Marvel Comics initially struggled in a red ocean, producing primarily me to knock off comic books. In the early 1960s, the Marvel business took a blue ocean turn by focusing on non-customer college students. Marvel invented characters that were people first and superheroes second, like the Spider-Man, the Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, and the X-Men. By the 1980s, value extractors took over Marvel and badly misaligned value, profit, and people. In late 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy due to a victim of Red Ocean management practices. New management purchased the business out of bankruptcy in 1998 but faced a daunting task. Cash was so tight that they almost missed payroll and movie rights for many of their best characters were licensed to others. First managers stabilized the business then Marvel again created a new type of blue ocean that went on to produce the most profitable movie franchisee in history. Now before moving to this case study, I would request everyone watching this video to subscribe 5 minutes learning channel in YouTube. Also this video is enabled with English subtitles for your better understanding. Now let's move to the case study. Marvel founded in 1939 by Martin Goodman. Marvel has seen a cast of heroes, villains and events that rival anything found in their comic books. Goodman produced pulp fiction magazines and comic books and his strategy was straightforward. Create many titles, then if you get a title that catches on, add a few more, you are in for a nice profit. Goodman's motive was purely financial, but over the next decades, his company would go on to create over 8,000 characters in what became arguably an American version of Homer's The Odyssey. During the 1940s, the comic book industry thrived, filling the entertainment space, which was now saturated by children's television programs, games, websites, and all other manner of media. Besides the iconic Captain America, which was created during World War II, most of the Marvel title of this era were thin knockoffs. Compared to most popular DC comics like Home to Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Except for a short time after the war, business boomed until 1954, when Dr. Frederick Wertham, a psychiatrist testified to the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency that comic books were linked to teenage pregnancy and homosexuality. Comic book sales plummeted and the industry created a self-censorship organization, the Comics Code Authority. Before Dr. Wertham, there were five major comic book publishers. By the time comic book hysteria succeeded, only two were left, which is Marvel and DC Comics. DC purchased Marvel's distribution arm and limited the number of books that Marvel could distribute each month. Marketing low cost and me to knockoffs targeting towards children would not sustain the business in this environment. Marvel needed to attract non-customers. Marvel's strategy of delivering little original work and Me Too knockoffs no longer worked for them. Faced with Red Ocean competition that threatened to shatter the comic book division, Marvel adopted a new strategy. Original content aimed at an older demographic college students. From 1961 to 1965, Marvel's editor-in-chief, Mr. Stanley, along with comic book legends Mr. Jack Kirby and Mr. Steve Ditko delivered a multi-year burst of creativity creating a new blue ocean. 
rather than copying DC's traditional macho crime fighters, many Marvel characters started as original ordinary people and are transformed often by accidents into reluctant superheroes. In 1961, Marvel introduced four ordinary people mutated by cosmic rays into superheroes, which is the Fantastic Four. After the Fantastic Four came the Incredible Hulk, a quiet scientist who morphs into a ferocious green monster when angered. Next came the Thor, a god who visits Earth as a superhero. Then Ant-Man, the reformed thief who changes sizes. In June 1962, Steve Ditko introduced the world to a teenager bitten by an irradiated spider who develops spider-like abilities which is the Spider-Man. Next came an alcoholic womanizing military contractor with a bad heart who builds a high-tech metal suit to fight bad guys, which is Iron Man. Not long after this burst of creative output, Lee and his team decided to bundle their superheroes into a group called the Avengers. At the time, they created another group of entirely different characters, ordinary people endowed with extraordinary powers, which is the X-Men. Stanley also created a new writing method, the Marvel method of writing, where he outlined stories, sent them for drawing, then filled in the story bubble later. By the end of 1965, Marvel circulated 35 million comic books per year, and inspired five fan letters per day. By 1967, Marvel sold six million comic books per month, just behind DC's seven million, despite that Marvel's distribution channel, which was owned by DC. They restricted the number of issues they could offer. In June 1968, Goodman sold Marvel to conglomerate Cadence Industries for $15 million. Cadence owned a print distribution arm, but they knew nothing about publishing. After the acquisition, Cadence hired Mr. Feinberg, the former CFO of Revlon. Legendary cartoonist Jack Kirby soon quit after the acquisition. He signed a three-year contract with DC Comics. As a result, the X-Men and Silver Surfer series were cancelled. Blue Ocean strategy requires the alignment of value, profit, and people. Marvel's comic books from this era were generally considered high quality, but internally, due to the lack of fair process, it damaged and demotivated the people. In November 1986, Cadence sold Marvel to New World Entertainment, whose executives did not know the basic difference between Superman owned by DC Comics and Marvel's Spider-Man. They turned to Wall Street for help. Their investment bankers decided to sell Marvel. In November 1988, investment bank Drexel Burham Lambert auctioned Marvel to Ronald O. Perlman for $82.5 million. Perlman, who was a multi-billionaire, used $10 million of his own money to finance the acquisition and borrowed the rest. Perlman immediately and repeatedly raised comic book prices. Perlman decided to copy the trading card strategy and built his own bubble in comic books. To fuel speculation, Marvel introduced many versions of every comic book, each with a different cover, encouraging collectors to purchase more volumes. Perlman's bubble strategy initially worked to raise revenues and he sold 40% of Marvel to the public in July 1991, raising $70 million. Perlman also consolidated 12 distributors into one. Perlman's goal was to effectively sell comic books directly to retailers, capturing revenue paid to distributors. The single source distribution system 
wreaked havoc in the market. The number of comic book stores quickly fell from 9,400 to 4,500. Pearlman's Marvel also decided to branch into trading cards and purchased three companies, sports card makers Fleer and Skybox, as well as an Italian sticker company Panini. Finally, Marvel acquired 46% of toy maker Toy Biz. High prices, fewer distributors, lower quality, underperforming acquisitions, and a predictable burst in the comic book. Destroyed sales of Marvel. On December 27, 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy. After bankruptcy in late 1998, Marvel had five high-level businesses. Number one is comic books. Marvel's flagship comic book business produced direct revenue and vast intangible assets. Intellectual property, decades of characters, storylines, brand, customer goodwill, and an institutional knowledge. Number two is trading cards. Marvel had two trading card companies, Skybox and Fleer, which had been combined under Pearlman. A third business, Panini, an Italian company that made trading card-like stickers, was ceded to Marvel bankers to end the bankruptcy. Third, toys. Toys were a low-margin business, but Marvel did well. Most 1990s era, Marvel's revenue came from the Thai group. Fourth, character licensing. Marvel always licensed characters. Licensing deals were optimal. With an investment of little, more than drafting a contract, Marvel need to do nothing but open envelopes and cash checks for high margin revenue. Finally, Marvel Studios. Marvel had a handful of people in Hollywood licensing Marvel characters to motion picture studios for films. This team, referred to as Marvel Studios, was not a real movie studio. They did not independently make movies and had no intention of doing so. Their goal was to drive sales of licensed goods by increasing demand for Marvel characters through films. The post-bankruptcy period, which is late 1990s, was a difficult time for Marvel. Comic book sales were slipping 20% year-on-year and licensing deals dried up because licensees were concerned about long-term contracts with a company that might cease to exist. Cash became so tight that Marvel almost failed to make payroll. In this context, Pearl Mutter and his board of directors hired turnaround specialist Mr. Peter Cuneo. Cuneo focused on Marvel's core businesses, selling comics books and toys, and licensed the exclusive movie rights to several of Marvel's most popular characters. Cuneo and the board reasoned that successful movie would spur sales of licensed goods, driving toy revenue. Additionally, the early movie deals provided much needed capital and helped prove the economic viability of Marvel-based comic book movies. Sony purchased the rights to Spider-Man for $10 million plus 5% first dollar royalties. 20th Century Fox acquired the rights to X-Men, the Fantastic Four and several lesser known characters on less expensive terms. Universal Studios purchased the rights to make standalone Hulk movies. Marvel does not release actual figures, but industry analysts estimate Tony paid Marvel nothing less than $62 million in royalties for Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3, which collectively grossed about $2.5 billion. Fox is estimated to have paid Marvel $26 million total for X-Men royalties. The films have collectively grossed approximately $2.3 billion. Blade, a deal struck during the Pearlman years, grossed $131 million and Marvel was paid $25,000. Although the deal may not appear favorable in hindsight, they served a strategic and tactical purpose. 
tactically, they brought much needed capital to Marvel in the form of upfront payments and increased licensing royalties, giving the company a breathing space to eventually move in a more strategic direction. In February 1999, Marvel divested trading card businesses. In March 1999, Marvel exited the toy production and sales business, selling exclusive rights to market Marvel characters for five years to their toy manufacturer for a $5 million per year fee, a 15% royalty plus an additional 24.5% fee for Marvel to continue designing the toys. Besides stabilizing the business financially, Cuneo moved to quickly heal the corporate culture, building an environment where creativity could thrive. Once management stabilized the business, there was a sense that a major strategic initiative was needed to boost the company beyond stability towards a blue ocean. In 2004, Hollywood veteran David Maisel who had worked at the highly influential talent firms approached Pearl Mutter with a radical new strategy to create a real movie studio to fund and produce Marvel movies. He reasoned that by licensing characters, Marvel was unnecessarily foregoing large profits. The current licensing strategy was literally ripping apart the Avengers. Pearl Mutter agreed and hired Maisel as COO of Marvel Studios with the intention of sustainably extracting long-term value from the business. Maisel convinced the board of directors to allow him to proceed and worked 18 months to eventually close the deal exactly as he described, which is $525 million in low interest debt, which was secured against Marvel characters with no financial risk to the business to produce Marvel films. Marvel premiered their first movie, Iron Man, in May 2008. The first movie was a blockbuster, crossing $585 million worldwide. Marvel located their California movie studio above a car dealership. Marvel eliminated the Hollywood tradition of spending on glamour that was not helpful for movie making. Blockbusters normally require movie stars, but Marvel reasoned their own characters were the stars and they needed talented, if lesser known, actors, directors, and screenwriters to bring their characters to life. To lock in the savings, actors were signed to long term contracts, with many obligated to appear in six or even nine films at rates negotiated while the actors were still lesser known. Even after these lockups expire, Marvel is known to replace actors in the same role but different movies, rather than offering significant raises. Besides using lesser known actors, Marvel also edited films to reduce shots that added cost without commensurate buyer value. Marvel also reduced middle management by failing to hire back the layers of managers lost during the lean years. Additionally, the leaner organization structure was able to move faster and assume more risk. Robert Downey Jr., who was an Academy Award winning actor suffering from drug addiction, he had been in and out of the rehabilitation and jail. Marvel was able to hire him, whereas traditional studios had more layers of executives able to exercise Miss Paltrow, who was an Academy Award winning actress who had taken time off to raise her children. After several actresses turned down the lead female role for Iron Man due to compensation issues, Paltrow agreed to take the role as a part of comeback. Marvel's success is because people who read the comics or see the movies get so connected to these characters. Besides the characters themselves, the storyline appealed to non-customers. Iron Man is more of a love story than a superhero movie. Finally, Marvel created a creative committee 
to craft the firms consisting of lead comic book editors and company executives to ensure the integrity of the characters and storylines. Rather than grant a carte blanche creative license for directors to bring comic books to life, Marvel executives retain this role for themselves, going so far as to replace traditional storyboards with cut-up comic books. Thank you everyone for watching this video. See you soon with another case study. For more such interesting case studies, please subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube.